Okay, so um, my name is uh, Peter Hartley, and uh, I'm the George A. Peterkin Professor of Economics at Rice University, and also uh, Rice Scholar in Energy Studies with the Center for Energy Studies at the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy at Rice. And uh, I'd like to welcome you uh, to this webinar this afternoon. Uh, and I have with me uh, Igor Hernandez, who's a PhD student in economics, uh, who's supported by the Center for Energy Studies, and also uh, Francisco Minaldi, who's uh, a fellow in Latin American energy policy and director of the uh, Latin American energy program in the Baker Institute. Uh, this uh, seminar is the first. We're going to have a little mini series here in July, the Center of Energy Studies. Um, and this one's the first one. Our series is on uh, graduate and postdoctoral uh, researchers at the Baker Institute. Um, and uh, we're very grateful that uh, the CES has allocated us uh, some seminar slots <coughs> for our students to uh, talk about some of the research that they're doing. Um, I also like to thank in my sort of role as uh, economics uh, department professor at Rice, I'd also like to thank the Center for Energy Studies uh, and its sponsors for supporting our PhD students uh, who are doing energy research here, here at Rice. Uh, these students also are teaching assistants in our Master for Energy Economics program, uh, which is actually quite distinctive as a program in energy economics. It focuses on teaching uh, economic, financial, and other analytical tools to professionals in the energy industry. Uh, and in fact, Francisco is one of our, our very popular lecturers in the program. And uh, so uh, those of you who are interested in uh, more professional education, masters of energy economics, please check us out. Um, I'd also, on the, on the RICE website, um, also want to note that uh, this series is uh, co-sponsored by the International Association for Energy Economics, uh, and they graciously agreed to publicize this, uh, this seminar as well. Um, the IAEE is the largest association for professionals specializing in the field of energy economics. Uh, they publish two journals, so the Energy Journal, which is one of the top uh, energy economics journals, and uh, Economics of Energy and Environmental Policy. Uh, also a newsletter, and they hold conferences, uh, virtual presentations uh, like this, along with a host of other product and services that you can uh, find at their website, www.iaee.org. Uh, for, for those of you in the Houston area, actually, there's also a local Houston chapter that has met, and uh, I hope we will soon meet again, <laughs> for monthly meetings. Um, the monthly meetings are held in the Houston branch of the Dallas Fed in a uh, building on Allen Parkway. Um, the other thing I would say about the IAE that's relevant to this seminar or this particular seminar series is that the IAE also um, supports students quite a lot. Uh, students um, come to their, their conferences, they actually get, can get some financial support for coming to the conferences. They put on special uh, student events. There's a PhD day um, and they have case studies uh, day. So um, those of you who are students, uh, please check out the IAE uh, website for uh, student activities. Uh, and the Houston chapter here also subsidizes students coming to our, our lunches. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available at the um, Center for Energy Studies and the IAE uh, websites. Uh, please use the uh, chat function uh, or the Q&A function if you want to ask questions. And uh, I'll be checking out the questions and uh, hopefully uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to put together some, uh, some questions to summarize the various issues that people are raising. Uh, I've already got one question actually ready to go. Um, for those uh, preliminaries out of the way, uh, I'm going to turn to, to Igor and um, I'll ask you first, Igor, uh, can you please tell the audience uh, what your research is about? Well, good afternoon, every, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about the, this research. My study focuses on oil and gas auctions, uh, and particularly for, for leases, which is one of the tools governments have to allocate uh, leases. Um, um, what aspect of the auctions are you going to look at? Uh, I mean, there's lots of things one could look at to uh, in auctions. So, <laughs> so what what I see initially is that uh, how governments balance multiple objectives using the auction design. In particular, I like to see uh, how bidding variables and the weight that these uh, variables have on the on the on the allocation rule can influence uh, investment and production 
outcomes. So, okay, I mean, uh, but you know, this is um, a more general problem. It's not just governments that are auctioning um, off mineral rights. I mean, here in Texas, we've got private landowners. In fact, one of our former students, Mark Agerton, um, who did his PhD here, uh, he studied um, private auctions of mineral rights in Texas and, and uh, Louisiana. So the private landowners also have to um, uh, have a problem to solve. They want to get revenue for, the, for their mineral rights. So what's the difference between uh, a government uh, trying to auction mineral rights and a private landholder? Yeah, I will say that the property right holders face the problem of selecting the most efficient company and try to induce them to, to bring high effort, even some levels of uncertainty. Uh, and I also think that governments, uh, want, as landholders, want to have the resource developed to raise some revenue. Now, what I see for, for the governments is that they also have additional objectives. So they want to have development and employment objectives, or they want to develop human capital and knowledge in order to have better institutions and have a, a local industry. But I would also, but I would also say that um, landholders and governments, uh, in some ways, they also face this issue of competing across uh, between each other. So countries have to uh, provide the, the most attractive uh, terms for investment. And also companies and governments, they have to play some sort of a repeated game in the sense that governments uh, have to offer leases or, or auction leases set several, several times in the, in, the, in the future. So what they do today so any decisions regarding to low changes, investor protection, or their, their willingness to hear concerns will affect the relationship with companies and investors uh, for the future. Yeah, so, so I mean, you, the idea is, I guess you're saying that um, governments have a lot of objectives other than just the price. I mean, normally in economics, we would think of, you've got a resource, you, you know, you want to allocate, you use prices, so an auction, auctioning it off is sort of a good way of raising uh, the most revenue you could for the for the resource. But uh, the problem is, is, I guess, that the government's got these other objectives, particularly development objectives and so on, like you say. So uh, given that auctions, you know, you, you, you're bidding for something, how can auctions kind of solve this problem of balancing objectives? Yes, yeah, so in that idea, I think auctions provide an open and a transparent process because it constitutes a better signal for investors uh, particularly in countries that are not that developed, compared to some, let's say, direct negotiations where the governments have a lot of discretion in, in negotiating the, the terms and in some cases might be susceptible to, to corruption. So in that sense, we are thinking about the multiple objectives. The government puts a fair value of the uh, competition, puts a fair value of the resource, but it also allows you to price different sources of risk, the, ge the geology, the price risk, and, the, and the, in, in some cases, the institutional risk, which I think is an important factor in, in Latin America. Yeah, so, so I mean, um, this question uh, of may being transparent, I mean, governments around the world, of course, have the same sort of problem um, that, uh, you know, they've got mineral, own, mineral oftentimes, got, I mean, here in Texas, we mentioned it's owned by private landholders, but around the most common situation around the world, of course, is governments own the mineral rights, uh, and they have the same sort of problem that they want to uh, auction off uh, those rights. Um, and, you know, you've got this in the US with offshore leases, uh, Canada, Australia, Norway, lots of other countries. W what's different about Latin America, though, than, than some of these other countries, do you think? I would say also that uh, Latin America, compared to, to some other regions, as you mentioned, they have different resource endowments, but they also have different political institutions. So in some cases, you have independent agencies in some of these countries, and in some other cases, regulation comes from a more centralized uh, approach. So I would say initially there are two main differences. I would see two main differences in that Latin America has a high fiscal and export dependence on these commodity revenues. That means that the design of the auction and design of the fiscal policy or the policy for the sector, it has a lot of a discussion as a, as, a, as a national policy. And I would also think that uh, the, the region historically has moved uh, in swings. So from a, a cycle of opening to a cycle of uh, the control on the rents or, or, or tighter regulations as a whole. And, and some of that is related to the political cycles. But as uh, Professor Monaldi also has an extensive research and has commented, uh, there's also a lot of other, other factors related to the oil sector that also uh, help to explain why in Latin America you have these sort of uh, cycles between expropriation and, and opening of the sector. 
And well, maybe that's a good point, a good time to bring in uh, Francisco into the um, discussion. I mean, do you have any comments, uh, um, Professor Manaldi, about the particular challenges the Latin, government, Latin American governments have faced in attracting investment in the oil and gas industry? Sure. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me. And, and great to be here with uh, Igor that, that is doing a very interesting uh, research on, on the, the, these uh, auctions in, in Brazil and, and Mexico. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that, let me just go back to some issues that you just discussed. I mean, um, first of all, I mean, one difference between uh, private leaseholders and, and government uh, leaseholders is that the government in the end is the one who enforces, uh, you know, an, a part of the government, of course, it depends on, on, on the country, but it, it's different because in, in a private uh, uh, system, you have, you know, uh, institutions that will decide, you know, if the contract is uh, abide or not. Here, uh, the own, uh, uh, the, the, the institution doing the, the leasing then uh, is uh, uh, can be part of the decision o o on the on the contracting, right? So, so the the, the credible commitment is a, is a big problem if the country doesn't have separation of power, strong institutions, etc. And as Igor said, when you have a country that is heavily dependent on fiscal revenues, the temptations, you know, to to do things in this space uh, are very uh, uh, significant. And so that that unfortunately has been the, the a little bit of the history of Latin America. You have a, a region with a lot of untapped potential. It, ha it has one of the largest resource base in the, in the world, but it has had a history of repeated change uh, contractual, forcefully contractual renegotiations, expropriations, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, canceling of, of, uh, of contracts uh, uh, using different uh, excuses. Sometimes, you know, uh, might, might have been reasonable, many times uh, not. So the, 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 that, of course, uh, affects also the way you uh, implement auctions because if there is that risk, uh, you know, it, it changes a little bit the, the way companies evaluate uh, a project and particularly when, when we're talking about large sum cost projects that, you know, have a very significant investment and a long period of maturity that, that could have a very significant impact. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, mean, I think there was a, uh, I was at a conference actually recently, IAE conference where, um, uh, there was the presenters had developed a model of this sort of cycles in, in um, uh, the development of resources. And the, the basic idea is that governments, um, once people have invested, the governments have an incentive to kind of uh, maximize the revenue because the investment's already been made. But the problem then is, is that it drives the investors away. And, <laughs> uh, and then, you know, the, the lack of development means that uh, government wants to change policy again to try to attract more investors and that kind of gives you this cycle exactly yeah so so g g given this um, need to balance out a lot of these objectives uh, maybe I'll go back to Igor mm -hmm. and sort of talk about I think that a, a key feature of your research has been that um, uh, how the government has tried to use auctions to balance out objectives is that right so maybe maybe you should explain that a little bit about how you can um, uh, right so 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 governments initially rely on a combination of, uh, of different barriers. So you can use uh, cash bonuses for, for entrance royalties, profit taxes, local content or work programs to either incentivize investment or uh, capture some rent as a whole. You know, while at the same time, you're trying also to keep the interest of the companies and the, and, the, and the profitability. And part of balancing these objectives and how to use the auction to balance these multiple variables is basically decide which items are going as part of the auction and which of them are going are set beforehand so in particular what i'm studying is something that is uh, known as a, a, a specific type of auction which is a uh, known as a, a scoring auction a scoring auction allows the company to submit several uh, items so you can submit a cash bonus a work program or some local content and those variables enter into a formula and that gives you a score so the company that gets the highest score is the company that wins uh, the auction. And this is a format that has been used extensively in, in procurement contracts. So for instance, if you're talking about highway construction projects, the companies can say how much are, going, are they going to charge to complete the project and how much they will take, how much time they will take to complete the project. And in that sense, I think one of the advantages of using this scoring auction, particularly for the oil and gas sector, which is, uh, has been extensively used also in Latin America, 
is that you can allow the market or allow companies to be more flexible in setting up these variables rather than just fixing the bonus or fixing the work program or fixing some of, some of these other variables. So I, I think that one of the advantages is just to provide flexibility for companies and allow them to have better entry and, and competition as a whole. I would also say that, of course, this is just one aspect of the auction. There are many other different things that they also determine the, the, the performance of the auction as a whole. You have to consider the, 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 the information that you have about the blocks because that determines that the uncertainty can lead to companies to overbid or bidding more than the fair value of the, of the block. Uh, you can also have problems with some of the bidders. So in Latin America, there are a lot of uh, national oil companies that may have better information relative to some other companies, and that can limit competition somehow. And you can, and even the size of the block can be important because companies may decide if they, if, if, if they think that they can delay the, the investment and delay the exploration because they want to see what happens to their neighbors and what are the results of their own exploration campaigns. As you will see, balancing the objectives is not, not just about using the scoring option or using this competing, these multiple variables, but also keeping into account the information context and the resource endowment as a whole. So, so what you're saying, I guess, is that they have a formula, right? The scoring thing is a formula. And so these different objectives get different weights in the formula, right? Right, correct, correct. And that, and that should, should should reflect the preferences of the government as a whole. Yeah, right. And and uh, you, in your case, uh, Brazil and Mexico have used those, right? Those two things, they're the, they're the two cases you study. Correct. And I guess the question, again, I might ask this question to Francisco, sort of interesting. I mean, do we know why Brazil and Mexico settled on this scoring auction idea because I don't think it's quite so common in, in a lot of other countries where they have this uh, explicit formula for the different components. Sure. So, I mean, in the case of Mexico, they gave a, a relatively uh, a small uh, role to play to the minimum working program. And it was mostly about uh, fiscal and uh, where the Brazilians gave, gave a more uh, weight to local content. And Igor uh, can talk uh, in more detail uh, uh, about that. But, you know, it's interesting because um, uh, these uh, uh, countries typically what they want to maximize is uh, the, fiscal, uh, the fiscal revenue. Uh, on the other hand, they have the issue of that, that if they, and, and, and that's one of the things that uh, Igor studied, that if, if they only uh, focus on, on uh, um, on the fiscal take that could have uh, some uh, consequences uh, and uh, one of the um, uh, worries that that i think uh, we might have is that you know governments overly concentrate on the government take as the measure of success you know they herald we got uh, uh, you know 90 percent or something but 90 percent of nothing is nothing right <laughs> so so if if uh, if nobody uh, ends up investing uh, mm -hmm. uh, because you know you got a sort of a winner's uh, curse or something it, it, it's not going to be a, a good result. They should think more about the combination of, of a different metric, which is sort of the combination of how much you get, because if the pie is bigger, it's because there is more and more investment and more production. Uh, even if you get a, a smaller, uh, uh, you know, government take, the, the total yield to the government might be, uh, might be bigger. Um, so, so that's, I think, in part what they try to balance. In Brazil, there is this long story of trying to promote the local industry of industrialization policy and i think they were misguided in attempting to use the auctions as a tool for uh, for uh, uh, for developing the local industry uh, with some results that uh, i i i will let uh, igor comment but that are not were not necessarily uh, the best yes yeah, so, so maybe igor you could pick up from there i mean how would so sort of your study of, of these scoring auctions in, in brazil and mexico how actually have they performed you know, sort of picking up from what uh, Francisco has said, you know, about the particularly this trade-off between revenue and, and development. Yes, well, one key component is that uh, Mexico, I would say overall, both countries have, has have, uh, have had a significant success in attracting private investment. Uh, for instance, Mexico, uh, even though we're still most of the companies in an exploration stage, the, the upstream investments represent close of uh, for private companies represent close to 25 percent of the total investments in the in the country and there's already 40 billion dollars approved in, up, in upstream investments so so in that sense there's a lot of still there's a lot of activity even in the context of, of, of covid that tells you something about the interest of these uh, companies uh, even though you, you still haven't seen a lot of the action in government in government revenues 
I would also think that the case of Brazil is, is, uh, is interesting because they started the auctions in, in 1999. And in that sense, uh, out of the 3 million barrels per day that are being produced today, around 700 of them are being produced by, by, by uh, private companies as a whole. And, and, and as a whole, the, the, uh, along with the development of the freezer layer in offshore, uh, which has been a, a, one of the biggest success in the last uh, 30 years, you can still see a lot of potential for investments in the next five years, close to $70 billion. As, as Professor Monali said, uh, there, there have been some issues in the design of the, of the auction in, in Brazil, particularly the weight, the, 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 the limits that they put on the, on the local content component, because companies essentially, they, they, they bid a lot on that component, but then they, 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 wouldn't be, they were not able to meet those objectives once they were verified, and then I have to have to renegotiate somehow because they impose significant costs to these companies. What I would say overall, those two experiences are, have been successful. I particularly focus on some of the aspects of the option, but overall I would say that experience has been very, very interesting so far. You say successful in terms of the revenue or development or, or in which ways? I would say initially in terms of in terms of the revenue that they have, because uh, particularly the signing bonuses that you will have for Brazil uh, total more than 25 billion uh, overall. And in terms of investment, they, they not only the exploration part allowed to identify a lot of resources, but also increase the production substantially. So that in turn eventually trickled down to, to, to government revenues as a whole. In the case of Mexico, you don't get to see that much of the government revenues yet, but you see a lot of activity in terms of, uh, of investment, even though they have, there has been a pause uh, right now in the case of the, of the auction. So does your research um, suggest any ways they could have done things better then? Or, or, yeah. So initially what I see in Mexico was that um, in Mexico, I look specifically at the, at the case of uh, onshore fields. So these are fields that, that, that were operated by, by Pemex and that essentially were offered to, to mostly local firms. And the government used a formula that, was, that, that had um, additional royalties to those established by the government and uh, an investment program uh, set by, by the, uh, in addition to a uh, work program set by the government. So what I noticed initially is that in these particular fields, a high weight of royalties led to companies to offer, for instance, levels of 60 or 70%, even 80% of additional royalties and essentially killing the project because you, don't, you, you didn't get to, to, to develop the project eventually. So what I was interested in initially was, okay, so, so, so how this rule was affecting bidder strategies. And in the case of Brazil, this success in terms of uh, developing the reserves, essentially what, 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 what allowed uh, the Brazilian government was to introduce a new rule uh, for the pre-sale layer, which include uh, a production sharing contract and an auction where the decision barrel was a profit split. So what I was interested in initially was, okay, how do we compare the initial regime, which had a scoring option that had the bonus, the work program, and the local content, how do we compare it with the, with the production sharing contract and the profit split in terms of government revenues and in terms of, of, of activity? And for that, essentially what I did in my, in, in my model was, was uh, essentially to uh, incorporate or merge the, a model of optimal development and exploration of the field with a model of an auction using game theory approaches right. that allow me to uh, uh, use the data and estimate some costs for these companies and then simulate what are the investment levels, what is the production, what is the, and what are the government revenues overall. Uh, that allows me also to simulate different weights of the rules. So for instance, different levels of royalties in the case of Mexico and mm -hmm. how in turn that would affect the, the levels of extraction as a whole. And, and, and so what is the suggestion coming out of that for how maybe they could have done better than what they did? So, so, what I find, so based on what I find, which is basically that the, the problem was that when you put too much weight on the royalties, what, what essentially happened is that companies didn't extract that much because then the, government, the, the, the royalties basically uh, led the companies to extract a, a lot less. And if you have a, a weight, that, that's higher than 50%, in the case of Mexico was over 80%, then you will have a decrease in government revenues as a whole. So in that sense, if you want to encourage 
the activity of small local firms, you want to have some ceiling somehow in, uh, for, the, for this activity. Um, in the case of Brazil, what I find is that actually from a cash flow perspective and from a way of providing incentives to companies, uh, you, you can actually, you could actually change the, some of the taxes in the, in the, in the system, uh, particularly the special participation tax, and get the same cash flow that you would be expecting under the production sharing contract. So you didn't necessarily have to change the, the, the rule as a whole, specifically for result. The problem is that uh, the result rule also had the, this condition that restricted entry because you were, having, you were imposing a high bonus, a high fixed bonus, and you also were requiring that Petrobras, the National Oil Company of Brazil, need to have at least 30% of participation initially. And that basically restricted the competition. So in that way, you don't let the auction work itself. And therefore, uh, you, you reduce your potential to get government revenues out of a, out of a high resource as a whole. So okay. in a sense, I, I, I would argue that, that that's a problem. You want to allow for more flexibility in that, in that sense. So, so I, if, if I let you uh, uh, go and address the, the government in Brazil or Mexico, you've got you know, two or three things you can tell them based on your research uh, to do differently. What would, you, what would you suggest to them? What, what's your... I, will, I, will, I will reduce the weight in the, in the case of Mexico for the onshore marginal fields. I will definitely re reduce the weight in that sense uh, because that, will, that incentivize the entry of inefficient bidders. Because in that sense, the, those companies are, are uh, it's cheaper for these companies to bid on the royalty component than to bid on the investment component. So, yeah. in that, so I will put some some weights or so, some some ceilings on, on that part, which is pretty much what the what the government did, but also allow for more information to happen. And Just, for Brazil. Uh, so people... And for Brazil. For Brazil, I would say that the 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 idea was if the priority is to keep the presence of Petrobras you probably need to change the, the terms of the bonuses and the fiscal conditions. So you want to have the, the scoring option to allow companies to put their own bonus and put their own uh, work program. If so the priority I'm... is to is to is to increase government revenues, then you let Petrobras compete with the rest. Okay, so then I'm going to ask Francisco. I mean, uh, so here's, here's Igor is making his recommendations. How do you think they'd be received? <laughs> Well, you know, in, in, in Mexico, actually, in the previous administration, I think they they would be have been very interested in, in, in these results. And I think it aligned some of the results align with uh, the, the things that they were uh, uh, learning from the I mean, they, they were in a process of learning when they did these auctions, they, they learned from that. And as, as Igor mentioned, what one of the things they did is to put a ceiling on how much you could bid uh, for the royalty. Um, uh, because they realized that you know that this this overbidding was uh, generating and uh, some bad results, I think they were hesitant to increase the the share uh, uh, that that wasn't about uh, government take and was uh, about uh, the, the minimum program. Because you know one thing that that the uh, designers in Mexico had a lot of uh, concern was. You know, they didn't want big, uh, uh, to emphasize signing bonus, for example, contrary to Brazil, because what they thought is if we emphasize signing bonus, the, the future governments uh, in a country that, you know, is polarized and they knew that there was a, a big uh, opposition to the reform from the left, uh, they, they, they thought maybe they, they argue that, oh, these guys, you know, put big signing bonus and then uh, uh, spent them. And, and, and now we have a lower government take uh, moving forward uh, that uh, uh, so, you know, they gave away these or uh, so. So they emphasize uh, the, the fiscal take in the future, in the life of the project rather than uh, and the progressivity of the system, uh, which was uh, an interesting uh, learning process. I think what they might try the, uh, uh, to uh, I think if they continue doing the bidding's because now they stopped uh, with the new government. I think they might try to do either something of what uh, Igor mentioned, or I mean, one of the things why they let uh, this. I think this is a very important point that Igor makes about the ad adverse selection of you know players that that went into that were bidding you know crazily. But part of the reason was they didn't have a big uh, financial uh, you know bond or, or guarantee that they had to 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 risk uh, uh, if they didn't fulfill their their part of the of the deal. The reason why I think the Mexican government didn't put uh, enough emphasis on that was because they wanted a smaller Mexican company. 
companies to be able to participate. In fact, those mm -hmm. round, round, rounds were aimed at, at uh, smaller local companies rather than the big uh, uh, companies. So, so maybe that, that trade-off, they, they might be willing to, to revise it. But I think Igor's uh, work is extremely important once uh, Mexico resumes <laughs> doing bidding. Uh, they, they, for now, uh, have, uh, have frozen the, 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 the process. Uh, uh, but I think these are very legitimate uh, concerns. And, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, I think it's important that, you know, auctions offer this very, if they are done properly, very transparent way to determine the government uh, uh, take that I think is less uh, prone to these suspicions that in Latin America we always have sometimes fundamented mm -hmm. that everything is corrupt. And, and so that's important. What about Brazil? I mean, you, you said a lot, quite a bit there about Mexico. How, how about the... Yeah, well, Brazil has moved uh, uh, out of the idea of of, uh, of putting so much emphasis on on local content, and I, I think uh, in in that sense they 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 did the the, the right uh, thing. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still surprised that that Brazil uses so much uh, uh, as, as, uh, signing bonus as a role, but as Igor mentioned, now they are. Uh, oh, I don't think he, he mentioned it yet, but but they are fixed now. The it's not a, a variable of, or a, a fixed amount. So I, I think the Brazilians have moved in the direction that, uh, that you would uh, uh, argue from Igor's research that they, that they should. Okay, um, uh, so maybe get back to you. I, actually, one question that came up, maybe I'll ask this right now, I suppose. I mean, uh, we, one of the audience, we got a question from the audience about uh, Guyana. And I suppose one, one, one question you could ask from that is, is uh, thinking about your research, does it have implications for other countries? For example, Bayana now, right, has new, new newly discovered resources. Or should they go down this road? Uh, how should they go about uh, designing auctions or, or uh, you know, right. given your research, what, what do you have to say? Do you have any right. I guess one of the main messages from the research is that you need to be consistent between policy objectives, the resource endowment, and the history of the, of the country. So, for instance, Guyana is a country that doesn't have a lot of history in oil. So probably what they need to have is at least to keep the activity happening while also getting a fair share of the, of the, of the revenues. And as Professor Monali said, you also need to have to incorporate a system that allows you to incorporate swings in the oil market, either from the price perspective or if you find additional resources. So the tax system at least should incorporate those. In the case of Guyana, they still use a direct negotiation approach, so, they, so which is different from auctions. So the conditions are pretty much set between the government and the company, let's say Exxon. But in, if they decide to move to an auction system, I would think that they should probably put more emphasis on the investment part and try to capture the, 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 the rents as a whole to a clever fiscal system. And then in order, in order to get the institutional's work, and then you, you have to think about some other, some other ways that, that the government can increase revenue. In the case, so in the case of Colombia, for instance, that the problem is different. Because then you have because you don't have that much of the resource and you need to keep exploring as a whole. And as I did, they essentially allow to have permanent rounds and keep us and, and keep the entry of companies so that you can keep exploring as a whole. Ecuador, Ecuador also has a, a similar system of the scoring option, for instance, in which you have a profit split combined with some uh, investments. So in that case, they the resource base and the history, the history of changes in regulation justifies the use of a profit split because in that sense, you are allowing to share the risk with the, with the, with the government while also keeping the, the activity. So as you can see, there is, the, there is depending on the context of the country, the resource endowment, the reputation that the country has, uh, that would affect how the, the, the risk perception of the, of the investors. So, so and that, and that also applies to countries like Venezuela where, where you can have a high resource base but then you don't have a lot of reputation right now. So probably relying too much on bonuses wouldn't be a good idea initially because despite the financing needs, because essentially what you, what, what you want to assure to the, to, the, to the operators is that you can have a fair share of the deals and that you don't enter into renegotiations uh, into the future. So I think resource endowment, the institutional component and the policy objectives all part, all part of the same equation. And, and, you know, we've been talking a lot about auction design, but I mean, there are a lot of other features of government policy toward this, this industry sector that, that influence outcomes. I mean, how important do you think the design of the auction system is relative to some of these other kinds of questions? Maybe right. So, 
So I would say that the initially you would, I think, for, for example, there's a lot of uh, objectives related to sustainable goals and how to think about uh, internalizing the impact that companies have from the, from the oil activity. So in that sense, it measures of, for instance, to the, to the tax system, the, the idea of, for instance, a carbon tax or probably having in the work program some points that qualify for companies that make additional investments into that sense can help incorporate some of these uh, objectives as a whole. Uh, again, that would depend on the, on the, on the purposes of the, of the country and the development goals that they may have. But in that way, you are allowing companies not to put too many restrictions. So you don't want to impose too many regulations in that, in that sense and, and some things that you cannot meet as a whole or, or requirements that you cannot meet, but rather uh, find a balance between companies and governments for something that can help develop the activity and in sustainable ways, but also uh, allowing for some stability of the of in revenues for, for the country as a whole. So, so auction is the weight that you put on them it, from, uh, can, can allow you to, to do that. So, and, and, but I will also say that the institutional context also matters. So uh, the, implement, the permits that you get, investor protections, tax stability clauses, all of that form part of the same equation because they lower the risk perception for investors. So, so in that sense, they, they all come part of the same uh, strategies that the governments have to have to pursue. And I guess the president matters, right? I mean, you want to comment, Francisco, on <laughs> what's happening in Mexico and so on? <laughs> sure. So exactly. I think that the Igor's point uh, in that uh, regard is, is, is very important because everything that you can do to actually create credible commitment on the contractual and fiscal system on, on uh, that, that you have the capacity to recourse uh, uh, by arbitration, that you have enforcement mechanisms, uh, that you have uh, independent uh, regulatory institutions and all that, that if, if you don't have that, you know, the, the auction uh, system will lead to either, uh, you know, offering uh, lower bids or, or having people that might offer like in Mexico a lot, but then, you know, they don't develop the, the project to actually accomplish the goal, which is the combination of uh, investment, that the activity actually happens, and then the revenues are generated and, and, and uh, captured by the government, you need to have this uh, uh, institutional uh, credibility. And that, and that requires a lot of things. It's not only the specific design of the, uh, of the sector, but of course, it requires political institutions that work and function. And if you have you know, a history like we have in the, in the region, this is something that investors uh, will take into, into account. Unfortunately, as, as Igor said, you know, Mexico is a success story in these auctions, without a doubt, you know, uh, the commitments in terms of uh, the companies that participated, the way the, the bidings were uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, actually executed, everything worked pretty well with some of these caveats that, that, uh, that Igor mentioned. But uh, now, of course, uh, uh, the government started changing everything. They still haven't you know, reneged on the contracts themselves, but, you know, they're generating all this noise that will have uh, uh, bad uh, effects, I think, in final investment decisions, because as, as uh, Igor mentioned, for now, what they're doing is doing the minimum uh, program that is in exploration, uh, but then they will have to develop th those fields. And if the government uh, uh, does not uh, provide credible guarantees by then, I think it, it's a problem. And I wanted just to comment on the, on the Guyana case, you know, you see the Guyana case, is, is, uh, it's one of those uh, of, uh, many examples in, in the developing world and in Latin America or in the region uh, in which the government now has, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, is not happy or, or people are, uh, in the political system are not happy with uh, what they uh, uh, gave because, of course, the, the, there was a great result. The, there was a big discovery and now, you know, uh, they have remorse of, of what they gave originally but of course you had to give very attractive conditions when the risk uh, exploration risks were, were very high but if they had done it through a, a, a an auction it would have been uh, much more transparent of course and it would have been clear that you know in, in a competitive uh, auction this was the government take that was offered and um, the other but as Igor also pointed out of course Guyana is a country without experience institutions you know, uh, it's hard for them to implement something sophisticated. So maybe in the next round with, uh, with some learning, uh, they can do more of that. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, given with the, the, the context, I guess, in which we're holding this webinar instead of the seminar, <laughs> I mean, part of the reason, you know, everyone, because of the coronavirus and so on, uh, one, one, another sort of implication of that is that we've got greatly restricted international travel and trade. Of course, you know, energy markets have been really belted around the years, got very low oil prices and so on. Uh, has that created uh, any kind of different issues, do you think, uh, with respect to these um, the, the, the things that you're studying? Yes, yeah, so I, I think that the, 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 the current climate, I think, uh, has increased the competition to attract investment. And I think that that leads to uh, higher flexibility in terms of the, the licensing terms. So, so initially, governments have tried to uh, increase the time that companies have to, to, to complete their investment. And they have, in some cases, they, are, they have provided some ways of tax reliefs in some more cases. But I would say that they push also to provide uh, automatic fiscal rules in some in some in some other in some other occasions. So, so in general, I would say that the, the 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 region as a whole has been able to match the 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 licensing system and the and the and the and the, and the regulatory system to their own to their own context. So, so for instance, uh, Colombia has has tried to uh, stim keep stimulating the, the the investments and having permanent rounds and having more flexible entry for, for, for companies because they still need to have uh, the, the development of the, of the resource. But at the same time, uh, you also see some postponements of some of the rounds because then companies, they have to rebalance their portfolio and they have to uh, rebalance the risk profile that they have uh, regarding the region. But, but overall, I would say that there's still some uh, insignificant opportunities if you are smarter in the, in the, in the institutional design and correlated with the, with the auction design. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, another question, I guess, is: uh, Did you have any? Did you, what, does your research have any implications? You think for other kinds of auctioning, other kinds of uh, uh, resources, and also maybe uh, outside of Latin America. So, I mean, you've studied these Latin American countries, but um, you know, do, do you have? Have you given any thought to to other kinds of uh, auctions and other kinds of uh, country, other countries? Yes, so so initially uh, that there is lessons to be learned for for cases of, of of UK and Norway, for instance, that they, they like you can you can they is to match policy objectives with the, with the, with the resource endowment and the institutional quality. So these countries that have higher institutional quality can afford to rely more on investment commitments as a whole because that that way that in the system allows them to uh, increase that that share of investment. But I would also say that there's implications for other energy sectors and, and, and also yeah, for, for other energy sectors. So for instance, in renewables, the, the scoring options have been also used in France and South Africa because uh, some of the dimensions that they include not only have the price of electricity that they will charge, but also uh, in, uh, uh, research and development expenses. And in South Africa, for instance, they use local development goals. So in a way, you also want to, using the government goals, you want also to uh, compare these different dimensions. And, and the problem that I was mentioning of getting aggressive bidders uh, and, and having this, uh, this idea of, of, of companies being too aggressive is that also happens in electricity because companies tend to bid very low uh, electricity prices uh, for, for building the, the, the generation plant in the expectation that either their cost will go down or that they will be able to renegotiate some of these uh, some of these contracts. So in that in that sense, you can delay the project if you are being too aggressive. So so the way, the, the weights that you put in the in the in the auction also matter if you want to accelerate the energy transition or not. And, and also there's other implications for mining that, re that are related to investment commitments as well because you don't want to have inefficient investment as a whole. You want to have a progressive system while also allowing for companies to enter and invest. Yeah, so, so I, of course, originally came from Australia. I mean, they have a lot of mineral leases there. The tradition there usually is um, what they call work program bidding, which is like a, a sort of an investment um, uh, element, uh, but also a, a revenue element, a, you know, sort of payment. I suppose it's a similar thing, but maybe a bit less formal, I think, from what you've been studying. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. It's just a, it's just one dimension, and then what I'm saying is that you probably need to consider some more elements into into other dimensions into the auction. Mm -hmm. 
so you think some of the other countries could could benefit from from looking at some of these uh, auctions? Definitely, and and the modern approach also allows to capture this type of uncertainties and the type of uh, tax systems that are involved into those other sectors as well. So you can tweak the model and, and adjust it for the specific sector because the problem of of balancing rents or lower prices and investment activities. And I, guess, I, guess what, and, and I guess where you started, you were sort of saying these these scoring auctions originally were for public procurement, like highways and bridges and all that kind of thing. And that's where most of the, the formal research has been done, looking at these auctions, right? It's sort of these uh, uh, governments procuring uh, transportation projects and, and yep. so forth, right? Yes. Uh, so, 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 yes, you're, 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 you're right. Just, you're, just a quick comment on that is basically an example that I provide with the highway construction project is that you want to minimize the effect that you have on delaying the construction uh, uh, in, in, tr uh, translated into problems of traffic. So what the auction actually does is that you, by incorporating the time of completion of the project, you are allowing the company to price that externality that they impose on society. So in that sense, I think the scoring auction, uh, for instance, in the, in, the, in the oil and gas case, can have a similar application because you can allow to price externality via carbon taxes or try to allow more productive companies to enter to that to that system. So 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 if you're clever enough on that part, then then you can actually help with those of some of these issues. Maybe I should turn at this point to, to some of the questions that have been asked. Um, so uh, I mean, one of the first ones came in was was to do with Venezuela. Uh, quite a few questions about Venezuela. <laughs> Given you're both from Venezuela. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's relations with uh, China, Cuba, Russia, Iran, and so forth. Um, uh, questions about uh, how's Venezuela's oil industry is going, uh, economy going to recover, and uh, is Venezuela in danger of doing things that are going to provoke the United States to military action? A uh, very wide-ranging question, I guess. There, but uh, uh, do you have any comments on either of you on on Venezuela? Go ahead, Igor. Oh, okay, so. Yes, I will try to, to be brief and, and forgive me if I don't address, address all the concerns and thank, thank you for all the, the questions. And I will say initially that yes, the, 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 one of the big challenges in Venezuela is to build a, the institutional capacities to enforce the contract. I think one of the key components of, uh, of auction design and how companies perceive the country is the, is the risk that the, the contracts might, might not be enforced, for instance. So in that sense, I think uh, there, is a, uh, there is a lot of potential for the country. Uh, I, I say that uh, not only for oil, uh, for oil, but also for, for gas as a whole, and different types of projects that can allow for different types of business models as a whole. So in, in that sense, what you what you would need to have is at least to provide a clear signal that you are committed to uh, to uh, provide flexibility conditions if the market conditions change, but also have a clear strategy on what are you going to do with, with the incumbents, which include China and, and Russian companies, for instance. So so a big part of the challenge is to build a consensus, as Professor Monali has said in some other occasions regarding what are the policy objectives for the sector, it, where this is uh, ingrained in some energy policy objectives overall, but also keep into account that the, that the, that the opportunity for to, to build those resources or build those capabilities is, is fairly short. So you wanna encourage the entry of, of, of new participants and the, and the entry of competition, and at the same time, ensure that at the, at the, at the, at the, in the short run, you at least have some financing for some of your things that the country will need in terms of infrastructure and in terms of the of the other needs. So, so, so at least I wanted to address that part. I, I'm guessing there's a lot of other questions on, on that part. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would like to mention, and there is a, a, a very specific question by a very distinguished uh, uh, Venezuelan economist, uh, Luis Javier Grisanti, there about uh, the government take and how to structure in Venezuela to make it competitive in, in, in the context of this uh, uh, of uh, you know a new uh, open of, of the oil sector, and I think that this is where uh, um, 
uh, Igor's work has a, a very important uh, role to play because, you know, Venezuela right now it, it has a very high government take, but it's very inflexible. It's, it's you know, 33% royalty for any uh, project at any uh, uh, price level. Um, uh, you know, there, there might, the, the ministry can discretionarily uh, adjust uh, for uh, the project for some time, but that doesn't give, you know, a, a credible uh, sort of long-term uh, uh, solution to the, uh, to the problem. And uh, so at, in, at, in some price environments and in some type of fields, that royalty is too high, but in some, you know, others, they, 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 it might be, you know, the government take could have been higher. So you need two things. You need a much more uh, well-designed and progressive uh, fiscal system uh, that adapts to different types of fields and to different types of, uh, of price environments. Uh, otherwise, you will have these cycles of renegotiation and these uh, incentives to expropriate. But also, you need auctions, uh, well-designed auctions. Uh, 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 Igor could uh, uh, advise them on how to do them. Uh, that uh, you know that that uh, generate the the right uh, uh, type of uh, uh, of um, you know government take versus investment uh, uh, conditions. And that are transparent, and that because the the, the the government doesn't necessarily know in that specific field if the, if the government take is low or or high. That that can be discovered by the competition in the in the bidding process. Uh, so uh, if it's well designed, uh, that 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 is a, a, a tremendous uh, plus. And I think you know the discussion in Venezuela sometimes is too framed into what is the right royalty rate uh, in general for the country. No, that, that, I don't think that's the question. The question is. Uh, uh, how do you design a system that in different uh, projects with different profitability and in different uh, market conditions will still be attractive for investors to develop the, the resource? And another question goes in that same direction. In a low price environment, the very regressive tax regimes that Latin America has that are based usually on, on high royalties and, 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 and not, uh, some of them not very flexible are, are, are really bad to, for this uh, situation. So, so we need to have more flexible tax regimes and we need to use more competitive bidding. Along those lines, I, there's a question here from Ken, which I think Madlock is very interesting, which is, you know, uh, to what extent should you design these systems as well for different kinds of resources? You know, the, you talked about the pre-salt, uh, we, we talked about Guyana, we've also got uh, Mexico, you, you, you know, the fields you're looking at there are secondary recovery and so on, Igor. So yeah. uh, that's the other thing, I guess, with these kinds of auctions that, um, you can design them for different sorts of resources. Uh, right? Yes, and and that's one of the one of the ideas also behind the, what what Mexico did because the, the, even the the auction rule of the the, 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 the the allocation rule in Mexico depends on the type of field that you're considering. So in some cases, when you're thinking about exploration projects or, or deep water, you're basically considering uh, profit shares, for instance, rather than the company that that other. Uh, areas where the geological risk is is, uh, is lower, um, the same applies for countries such as uh, Argentina. In Argentina, you have basically you're having these scoring options for offshore, which is considered a frontier area, and what they have is essentially something for bonus, but, but it doesn't, which is a part of one component. But the major component is incentives for award programs for investment because they, their target is to, to develop the, the, the resource base as a whole. So, so in that sense, there is some correlation between the, between the type of project and the fiscal system. And that also applies to the, to the auction design. So, so to put it in perspective, 70 to 80% of the, of the government revenues are coming either from royalties or profit taxes like worldwide. So if you include them in the, as a big dimension, either the profit split or the, or the royalties, that and allow the market to price it properly, you can accelerate somehow the, the activity and also at the same time getting a bigger pie or a bigger and, 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 and potentially a bigger share if you hit uh, some threshold in terms of uh, production. So if you have a significant discovery, you can get high government revenues from that without concerning about the government takes and some more and some more considerations. So so I think there's a the, 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 as Professor Monali said, the, 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 you can tailor the, the, the design, the auction design and the tax system design to the specifics of, of the field and also keep into account these other sort of like policy constraints. And, and, and I think that that's very important because sometimes, you know, in some of these countries, they set in the law very restrictive types of contractual uh, systems for everything. 
or, or, or one um, size fit all fiscal system. And as Igor is saying, and the question by, by Ken uh, implies, uh, you need the flexibility to uh, 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 do different types of auctions for different types of, of fields. And you sometimes want to attract different types of companies uh, and, and you have different uh, realities. You got, have offshore gas, you have very large, uh, uh, you know, high sunk cost project, uh, high sunk cost project. Then you have some shale, uh, for example, in Argentina, that, that is a totally different type of, of, of framework. So I think the structural character, characteristics of the field in terms of profitability, size, uh, uh, type of company, uh, technology require all those things. Um, uh, will uh, uh, affect the way you uh, uh, do the, the contractual and, and, and the bidding process. Okay, I guess there's just a couple of other questions here I guess I put together, which are um, sort of the, uh, can, you, can you bring environmental uh, issues or, or econo economically sustainable development kind of goals into these auctions or any of the countries tried to do that? Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, either by, by part of a negotiation program or, or, or direct negotiation, either part of the option, you can include this uh, development goals into the work program as a whole. So, so there are specific tasks that they are related to abandonment cost or the, or the or stories of or specific environmental impact that can be priced into uh, as units as, uh, in part of the, of, uh, of the auction. But, but as I was saying also, I think an interesting uh, mechanism to explore will be the inclusion of, of taxes to, to the activity or depending on the type of crude, for instance, or depending on the CO2 content, for instance, because you, that, that, would, that would make some fields more profitable than others, but, in, but more generally will allow the company to internalize that effect that it has on the, on the environment. And I would also argue that even by including these variables, you can actually help with the screening of these companies, because probably if you include this part, let's say, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be the, the case. But if you include a, a, a carbon tax as part of the bid dimension, you are allowing more productive companies to uh, bid more aggressively on that part and probably be able to fulfill those goals, provided that you have some specific savings for that or, or appropriate ways for that. So, so in that sense, I think some countries are, are getting into that direction and trying to provide more information into their work programs, but definitely, uh, what, what you want to have is to, a way to internalize those costs for the, for the companies. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the economics are there also for that. I think uh, just one minor caveat that I think you should be careful in not making too complex this uh, point system with many, you know, uh, variables uh, because they, it could end up, you know, having all sorts of uh, unintended consequences. But I, I agree that it's, uh, that it's possible to do something on that line. I think I also mentioned yesterday, I, I also heard yesterday that there was this idea of within the program getting some uh, commitments of uh, planting trees and some other things as part of the, of the, of the commitment of the company, but that's, this is not part of, the, of, of an auction. It's just part of, the, of some proposal that companies have. But I'm not saying that will be the way, but I'm guessing there is an interest on, on doing that. Yes. I've, I've just uh, one more. I've got a, a few questions here. People are quite skeptical that the, anyone's ever going to want to invest in Venezuela. But I guess uh, <laughs> the idea here is going to be we look, we're looking to the future, right? Where there may be a change of government. Then the question is, what can the new government do in a way that would be uh, credible for investors? I suppose, right? Is it? Um... Yes, I mean that's uh, there. There reasons to be to, to be skeptical in the sense that uh, you don't know what the future uh, still looks like. But I think that it's the is the, is the idea is to work on something that provides credible signals and, and, and that I think it's important to have a consensus regarding what's the what, what's going to be the policy for the for the sector. We, 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 it's clearly it's clear that the private investment is necessary for the country. But there are also some constraints imposed by, by their goals for these companies and how they reposition portfolio and how and what type of projects they want to invest. So probably lonely projects, maybe may, uh, if you don't provide enough conditions, maybe maybe at risk in some cases, the risk of stranded assets is, is there. But I would also think that uh, investor protection must be one of the key aspects in any, any, in any type of reform, but that also uh, that goes into a broader problem of, uh, of uh, getting the long-term policies. And that means that you need to have a, a political agreement of some sort uh, for the country. So, so 
my brief response, but uh, surely there's a lot of elements to be addressing. I, I just, just want to add that, that, of course, you need a, some uh, credible, uh, you know, a, a different government and a, and a, and a credible uh, regime to uh, attract investment. Having said that, you know, Venezuela has a geological endowment that is uh, spectacular with very low uh, risk. Uh, and uh, and right. so uh, in, in between producing 300,000 barrels that it is producing today and 4 million barrels that it should be producing, <laughs> I think there is some space for, for some uh, uh, locally for, for some investment, even in a, if the situation is not perfect. Okay, so anyway, our time's up. Just one last thing, uh, Igor, you're going to have your papers are going to be available on the Baker Institute website. Is that that's right? Yeah, we already have some some work done on, on, on the Venezuelan case. In order, if you want to know more about what what happened, there is a, as part of the project with the FDI and resource rich uh, regions that provides a context of some of the things that happen in the country. But yes, uh, that there will be also some more publications uh, like uh, in the form of a blog and also discussing some of the issues that we that we discussed today. So, so always open uh, to, to questions and, and, and comments. This is an ongoing research, of course. And, 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 and also very thankful for the, for the opportunity of having the, the C, uh, being part of the CES and being and the privilege of interacting with all, all of, the, of the fellows, including both of you, because that informs a lot of the, of these policy of these policy questions as well. So, so, so the work is important. Visit our, our Center for Energy Studies uh, webpage and the webpage of the specific uh, uh, researchers, and you will find uh, links to a lot of the uh, uh, issues that we're discussing now. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think our time is up. Uh, so I uh, thank both of you very much for your, for your comments and uh, certainly welcome uh, all of our guests to, uh, to go to the Baker Institute website and uh, search for your work. Thank you very much. Th thank, thank you, Peter. You. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Thank you.